In this video, we'll discuss the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom and compute the Bohr radius of a hydrogen atom. So to start off, we have a proton, which is going to be fixed at our origin, and we have an electron, some distance r, the radius away from that, and it is traveling with some velocity vector v, and it is going around in a perfect circular orbit. So the velocity vector is always going to be perpendicular to whatever the radius vector is from our origin of the nucleus. So to think about this and try to compute what the what radius this has to be under certain conditions, let's look at angular versus linear motion in physics. So some review of general physics. So linear motion, we have mass, and that's the resistance to acceleration. The resistance to rotation is the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia equals mass times radius squared, radius of whatever you're rotating around. For velocity, that's analog as angular velocity, omega. The little w with the sides curled in is the Greek letter omega. So velocity equals the radius times the angular velocity, which is equal to 2 pi times the radius times the frequency of rotation. So nu, the frequency, how many times do we rotate per second? And the distance you travel per rotation is the circumference, 2 pi r. So circumference time is the distance times how many times per second gives you a speed or a velocity. For momentum, linear momentum goes to angular momentum. Linear momentum is mass times velocity, m times v. Angular momentum is the moment of inertia, the analog of mass, times angular velocity, the analog of velocity, which in the case of perfect circular motion is going to be mass times velocity times radius. And kinetic energy in both cases is just kinetic energy, sometimes represented by the symbol T. Uh, try not to confuse that with temperature. I'll try to make it clear when T represents kinetic energy and when it's temperature. But if I slip up and don't indicate which is which, uh, call me out in the comments and I'll have to do something to fix that. Okay, so kinetic energy in linear motion is one half mv squared, mass times velocity squared, which is also equal to one half momentum squared divided by mass. So similarly, in, in angular motion, rotational motion, we have kinetic energy equals one half moment of inertia times angular velocity squared, which is also one half angular momentum squared over moment of inertia. Okay, so if we imagine that we have this proton here, or this new electron in a rotating reference frame, so it's constant while the frame rotates around it, there are two forces that come into play. Number one, it has the Coulomb force, the attraction of oppositely charged particles pulling it towards the nucleus, and it has, on the other hand, the centrifugal force. Now, there isn't actually any force pulling this electron away here, but it's, it's just an artifact of the fact that we treat it as a rotating reference frame with a constant uh, electron. Okay, so the Coulomb force is charge 1 times charge 2 over 4 pi epsilon naught distance squared. So charge of the proton is plus E, charge of the electron is minus E, and so the Coulomb force is minus Q1, Q2, so it's E squared over 4 pi permittivity of free space times radius squared. This is equal to the centrifugal force, which for a particle staying constant in a rotating reference frame is going to be mass of the electron times velocity squared over radius. Okay, so we know E, we know pi, we know epsilon naught, we know mass of the electron, but we don't know its velocity and we don't know its radius. So this is a situation of two unknowns. So we have V and we have R. So how do we solve an equation with two unknowns? Well, we have to generate in another equation, then it'll be two equations, two unknowns. So Niels Bohr in 1911 had a hypothesis, and that was to assume that the angular momentum of our electron is quantized. So that means that angular momentum which equals mass times velocity times radius in perfect circular motion, equals n 
t a an integer times h bar. So h bar is the reduced Planck's constant, so it's Planck's constant over 2 pi. h bar is going to show up everywhere in quantum mechanics, so it will uh, suit you very well to memorize as soon as possible just that h bar is h over 2 pi. And this n here was a number which is uh, greater than or equal to, I think it's actually greater than or equal to zero here, but it is some integer, so it's a quantized value. Once again, we have a quantum hypothesis generating our second equation for two equations, two unknowns. Okay, so now this is an equation which has mvr equals n h bar. We know h bar, we know n, and we know me. So now we have two equations with v and r, and we can solve for the, it's for the value. Okay, so solving this one, we have v equals n h bar over m r. And we can substitute that into this equation here. And what we'll have is our first side, e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared equals m e over r times this quantity squared for v squared. So we have n h bar over m r squared. When we do that, we get m n squared h bar squared over r cubed m squared. So we can simplify out some terms here between the two things. We have m squared on the denominator, m in the numerator, leaving an m in the denominator. We have an r squared over here and an r cubed over here. So this r squared goes away, leaves a single r over here. Then if we cross multiply both sides, we do r m times e squared, gives us that value. We do n squared h bar squared times 4 pi epsilon naught, we get that value. Now we divide both sides by m e e squared, we get r equals 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared n squared over m e e squared. Okay, so if we solve this value for n equals 1, we know pi epsilon naught h bar m e and e, this gives us 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. So that equals 52.9 picometers, a picometer being a trillionth of a meter, or 10 to the minus 12 meters. So we can also express this in a unit which is very convenient for atomic length scales, which is the angstrom. So one angstrom equals 100 picometers, or 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is also 0 0.1 nanometers, nanometer being 10 to the minus 9, or 1 1 billionth of a meter. So in that case, that gives us that r equals 0 0.529 angstroms. This radius is called the Bohr radius and is sometimes represented by the symbol a naught. So this is the radius at which n equals 1, and then the radius goes up quadratically with n there. So for n equals 2, our next quantum of angular momentum, according to Bohr, we'd have r equals 4 a naught. Then for n equals 3, r equals 9 a naught and it goes up quadratically as you go up in your values of this quantum integer n. Okay, and this Bohr radius is also a sometimes used as the unit of distance on atomic length scales as well. So sometimes you need to pay attention to whether we're discussing things in angstroms or discussing them in Bohr, but uh, this Bohr radius is definitely a very important result that Bohr had this quantization hypothesis for angular momentum in a hydrogen atom, and it leads to a definite value for what the ground state radius of this hydrogen atom is.